Hey, what's going on guys? Welcome to the Triggered Precision Machine with episode number three of the Precision Rifle Reloading Series. Before we kick off the reloading stuff today, I just wanted to throw a couple updates your guys' way. First off, we've been super busy this week, busier than average with pistol slide milling. So all of a sudden this really blew up and I think it's probably because of our short lead times. So I've been having a two day processing time, three days max for most of the slides, just depending on what the customer wants done. But they have been coming out awesome and we have added the EOTech E-Flex optic cut to our lineup now. So I'll show you guys a picture of that. Came out really nice. But now we're capable of doing pretty much every major brand of pistol and every major footprint for a red dot sight on your pistol. So if you guys have slides that you need milled for red dots or slide serrations or other fancy stuff, let me know. I can do that and I'll get it back in your hands very, very quickly. Same thing with Cerakote. Now on the precision rifle side of things, we had a couple really cool updates this week. And as you guys know, my whole business model is to keep the lead times down as low as possible. So I've been constantly searching. Every night I search for new vendors to shorten up the lead times and, and vendors who are able to supply me the products I need to build you guys, your rifles in a short amount of time. So we have, uh, we have really good resources for actions right now. We have Terminus, who's been really good. In fact, Joel Russo just sent me a text message this morning. I had another action chip out, spot on, spot on as far as the timeline goes. And he's been very reliable as far as shipping the actions on time so far, which is more than I can say for some of the other manufacturers out there. But that being said, we have a new contact for bolt action receivers that I'm very excited about. And this is a company that I had never heard of before. They reached out to me last week. It's a newer company. They've been in the R&D phase for, I think you said the last couple of years, last three years, and they just came to market last year. So they're based out of Canada. So as long as it's built in North America, I'm pretty happy with that. So we'll support our neighbors to the north. But I have one of those actions showing up today to evaluate and I'm gonna build it and we're gonna see how it runs. And if they work, I might be heading to those guys for my primary supplier of actions, which is cool because they claim they'll give me an action in my hands in five days or less, which is very impressive. That's the fastest lead time there is right now for actions and that's exactly what I need. With the barrel stuff, we're still dealing with proof. They've been pretty good about supplying actions on a constant basis. We've had no supply issues with them so far. We have a really good stock of proof barrels. I think I have close to 30 sitting on the shelf back there. Some of them are spoken for, but the majority of them are not. So if you guys need a proof barrel for a project, let me know. I probably have it. I have all the popular calibers, some prefits, the blanks, carbon fiber, and stainless. I have a bunch of stuff back there. So on that note, we're looking good as far as finding our vendors and developing a network to keep the lead times down. Because when I have the products in hand, I can turn out a rifle in a couple days. And that's chambering, threading, Cerakote, and also zeroing the rifle and checking for accuracy. So it's a short process once I have the stuff in hand. And once again, we're trying to resolve these issues in this industry right now with these extra long lead times. Waiting 15 months, 16 months for a action is unacceptable. This, th there's no other industry that that is acceptable. Not even the car industry when we were having chip problems and with the, uh, some of the foreign cars, like the, it's, it's just unacceptable. So we're looking for vendors that can supply us products quickly so we can keep the lead times down. And so far, it's looking really good, you guys. We've had a couple little glitches along the way, but that's to be expected. But all the rifle builds we've done so far have come out absolutely awesome, and they all just hammer. So, before we get started on reloading, one more thing too. We still have the TPM five shot challenge going on until the end of this month. And if you want one of those business cards to shoot the challenge, I'll have a link uh, down below to the original video where I described the rules and how to enter. But just shoot us an email at admin at triggeredprecision.com with your address and your YouTube handle and I'll get you a couple business cards sent out so you can shoot those and then return them and try to win a prize at the end of the month. 
So that's enough of that guys. Now let's get started on the reloading stuff. Today we're gonna go over brass prep and this is gonna be a long episode that focuses on a couple different methods that I use. We're gonna mainly look at prepping fired brass and we're gonna look at prepping unfired brass. And yes, I do prep new unfired brass. So we're gonna look at both of those uh, methods and how I do that. And we're gonna talk about some of the whys and some of the benefits and disadvantages to doing some of the things and kind of talk about the, the time that goes into prepping brass and what I think is worth your time and what I think is not worth your time. So here we go guys, let's get started. All right guys, here we are back in the reloading room, which is due for a remodel, by the way. So you should be seeing a nice clean reloading room here in the next couple months. Um, but let's get started with the brass prep. So as I mentioned in the last video, we're gonna be prepping brass and doing all the load development for this series with a six Creedmoor. This is a new fresh barrel on this rifle. It's only been broken in with factory Hornady ammo. It's got about 30 rounds through it, which is where I like to have it before I do any load development at all. So we have uh, some Lapua brass here, some fired Lapua brass, and this is from a previous six Creedmoor barrel, but that's what we're gonna do our brass prep on today. Also, as you guys saw in last week's video, I have a box of brand new fresh Lapua brass, six Creedmoor brass, that we're also going to prep to load today. So first thing we do to get started is we have our, our nice spent cases here. It's beautiful, once fired Lapua brass. And we gotta knock the primer out of it. Before we do anything at all, that is the absolute first step. So to do that, I like to use just a, a universal decapping die. I have one by Lee that's in the press right now. It's super cheap, it works excellent. And the point to using a universal decapping die as opposed to your sizing die that has a decapping pin is I like to keep dirty brass out of my nice dies. So some people will claim that this is untrue. I beg to, beg to disagree. If you have a fired case, and especially one that hits the ground or comes out of a dirty rifle or something like that, it's got carbon, it's got dirt, it's got other stuff that cakes around the outside of the case. You run that through your nice sizing die and it acts as an abrasive. So not only does it make sizing more difficult, but it also wears out your die or it can change the inside dimensions and the finish of your die and make your die more rough. So I like to have nice, clean brass to run through my expensive dies. Our dies are meant to last a lifetime. I try to take care of them and that's one of the small things that we can do to try to preserve the life and quality of our dies. So we're gonna knock the primers out with our Lee Universal Decapping Die and we will go from there. All right guys, I'm out of picture now but you have a really nice view of the Area 419.0 press. I love this press. This press, I will be 100% honest with you, it doesn't produce any more accurate ammo than any of the other commercially available presses out there. It's just a really nice, clean, easy to use, and luxurious press. It's super comfortable. All the parts are nice. I like the rotating turret head. It makes things really nice and fast when you're setting up for uh, multiple calibers. And of course, you have a bunch of cool features like the precision ground, uh, shell plate for precision bullet seating and a couple other things that I'll show you guys later on in the video series. But for now, we just have a standard RCBS shell holder in the bottom. We're gonna put our six mil case in there and run it through the decapping die and knock the primer out of the bottom of the case. So we have a whole bunch of brass here to process. So we'll run through a few of these and then we'll talk about what happens next. All right, we have all of our brass decapped and ready to go. So we have about 35 pieces of brass here that are ready for the tumbler. And that's enough to get us through the whole OCW test and have a few pieces of brass extra to do any sort of other load development that we might need to do. So for our tumbler and for cleaning up the brass, you have two options. And I have them both here in the shop and I use them both, but 
I predominantly will use the wet tumbler, the rotary tumbler with stainless steel pins to clean up my precision rifle brass. I think it does just a little bit better job and as you guys will see here later in the video, when the brass comes out of the rotary tumbler, it looks almost new. It almost removes all of the carbon from the brass. Some people will say that's not a good thing. I beg to differ. So. If you use a vibratory tumbler with the corn cob media or the walnut media, you'll see that you leave some carbon on your brass and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but again, I like to have control over every aspect of my reloads and having carbon caked around the inside of the neck or inside the primer pocket, to me, that's just another variable that will produce differences in your velocity and accuracy. So. Once again, it's an easy thing to control. It takes very little effort to tumble a couple hundred cases. Then you got to dry them out, which is really the only downside to rotary tumbling when you're doing it wet. Uh, other than that, the tumbler works great. I'm using a Extreme Rebel 17 tumbler and stainless steel pins from, uh, I forget the name of the website, but I think it's stainlessteelmedia.com or stainlessteeltumblingmedia.com. They're just little tiny cylinders in there that get into all the nooks and crannies on your brass and clean it out really nice. So let's take a look at the rotary tumbler in action right after we load it up, of course, and we'll give it a little time and then we'll pull our brass out after that and we'll get going with the next step. All right, now I have you guys pointed down here at the rotary tumbler so you can get a good view of what's going on. But this rotary barrel right here is just filled up with a bunch of these little stainless steel, hopefully that focuses, stainless steel pins. So they work great, they last forever. You lose a couple every time you use the machine just because they'll fall out of the primer pockets or the primer, the flash holes or whatever, but you lose a few, so every once in a while you gotta buy a little baggie of them to replenish your uh, stock. So, all we're gonna do is we take our six millimeter brass, and I have a little extra brass in here because I decapped all of the Hornady brass that I broke the barrel in with, so we're gonna play with that later. But all we do is dump it in. And we fill it up with water to about an inch from the top. And then after that, we add this detergent. So there's a couple different variations of detergent that you can use. So I used to use Dawn dish soap with a little little tiny pinch of Limmy Shine. This stuff is just kind of an all-in-one detergent that does a really good job of getting rid of all the powder fouling and then it also throws a really good shine on the brass like you guys will see here in a little bit. I put about probably 60, 65 cases in this machine. It'll hold a lot more than that. I can put at least a couple hundred cases in here and it works just fine. It extends the tumbling time a little bit. So for this, I might run it for an hour and a half to two hours maybe. If I had 150 to 200 cases in there, I'd probably run it for four hours or so. But that being said, we'll throw some water in here and we'll put our lid back on and we'll get it running. All right, so I went out and got some water and all this is is water right out of the garden hose, nothing special. So we'll just fill this up to about an inch from the top. Right there will do. All right, so we fill that up and I just take a tablespoon of this stuff and they come with a little measuring device inside of it. And it has a chart on the back showing you how much to put in there depending on how many cases and how dirty they are. So we'll just put maybe a little bit more than a tablespoon in there. All right, so after we have it all sealed up, all we have to do is throw it on the rollers right here and turn the machine on. And that's it. All right, while we're on the topic of cleaning our brass, I figured I'd show you guys the vibratory tumbler as well, because I'd imagine there's some people who are gonna be watching this who have zero ex reloading experience at all. So I'd be remiss if I didn't go over both of the options and at least show you guys kind of what they were so you know what to look for. So this is a vibratory tumbler. This is a old Dillon CV750 model. I've had this thing for probably close to 20 years. Runs great. They have a couple different sizes of this. I think this is the smaller one. They have like a, a 1000 or a 1250 or something that almost doubles the capacity of this thing. But all this is, is, if I can get this cut off. All this is, is a 
barrel like that, and you add your corn cob or walnut media to it, you add a couple hundred cases of brass, you turn it on and it basically vibrates the whole barrel right here and it gets all the carbon and stuff off of the, the brass. I'll typically use this for my bulk brass. So if I'm bulk reloading pistol or 223 rounds or something like that, then this is what I use. And also, if I have a lot of lube or something to get off my precision rifle cases after a sizing operation, I'll throw them in here for about a half an hour and that takes up all the lube off your brass really nicely so you don't have to do it by hand. So if you have a whole bunch of cases to do, that's really nice. So this is another option and these things aren't too expensive. They last forever, but one of the downsides is you do have to occasionally replace your media. So if you're using uh, corn cob or walnut, they sell it in like five and 10 pound bags, not that bad. And then generally there's a, a polishing additive that you can add to your, your media and it gives your brass a really nice shine. But another great option guys, and I, like I said, I prefer to get my precision rifle brass really clean, like you guys will see here in a little while when we pull that brass out of the rotary tumbler. But I've also loaded some incredibly accurate and consistent ammo prepping my brass with this machine right here. So to each his own, there's a lot of different opinions on which one's better. I've just kind of drifted that way um, in the last couple years and that's worked pretty well for me. So there we go. All right guys, so we let that go for a couple hours. The brass should be nice and clean. So now we just have to separate the brass from our stainless steel pins. So to do that, I use this little media separator here. This one's made by Franklin Armory. There's a bunch of different versions of this commercially available. They all work just the same in my opinion. So get whichever one is available to you. So to use it, very simple. Just open it up like this. We gotta take our tumbling barrel off, undo our little thumb nuts here and our brass should be nice and clean now all right you can see the water's got a pretty murky murky look to it it takes off a lot of carbon, a lot of stuff. So then we just pour it in here, water and all. And you see there's our brass. And we pour all the brass out. All right, from that point, we seal the little barrel up here. And then it's just a matter of rotating this thing around until we get all the stainless steel pins out. And then usually what I'll do is I'll dump the dirty water out since we poured all the contents of the tumbling barrel into the media separator. So there's all the dirty water sitting in the bottom. What I will do after that is I'll empty out the dirty water and then I will put the pins back in the tumbling barrel and I'll refill this thing with fresh water so the brass is completely covered with fresh water. And then I'll spin the brass in here a couple more times just to make sure I get all of that nasty uh, carbon filled water off of the brass. So it turns out to be really, really nice and clean after we're all done. So we'll get to it. All right, we stepped outside for a second, just got a little bit better light. But here you can see the brass that came out of the tumbler. It's just absolutely perfect. I mean, you get all of the carbon fouling out of the primer pockets. I'll throw some close-ups on the screen here in a second. All the carbon fouling out of the neck and it's just absolutely beautiful and ready to reload. So after we get it out of the tumbler and we separate all the stainless steel pins, then you end up with wet brass. It's a pretty simple thing. It stresses some people out dealing with wet brass, but it's really not a big deal. If you have a nice warm day like it is today, this stuff will dry out in a couple hours. But all I do is I put the brass on a towel like this, or if I have more brass, I'll put it on a bigger towel. And I just roll it around like that and try to get all of the, shake it a little bit, try to get the water out of the inside and the water out of the exterior surface of your brass. And after that, all I do is set it out in the sun. If it's a cold winter day, then you can also put this in the oven at like 180 degrees or whatever the lowest temperature your oven will go. And you're not gonna contaminate your oven, just throw it on a, a cookie sheet that you don't care about and you're not gonna use for baking. But just throw the brass on there and let it 
cook in the oven for, I don't know, a couple hours and that should evaporate most of the water out of the brass and it doesn't do anything to hurt your brass. It's not warm enough to anneal the brass and it doesn't do anything to change it metallurgically. So there's a couple different ways to dry it. Those are a couple ways, but you end up with nice brass and now we are ready to size our brass and proceed with our brass prep. So we will go check that out next. Let's get going. All right, guys, now comes the fun part. We get to talk about a hotly debated topic, and that's brass annealing. Some people swear by it. Others say it's not necessary. Some people are in the middle. I'm one of those guys who depends on what cartridge I'm shooting, but I swear by it. And I usually anneal every firing or every other firing just to maintain good, even neck consistency across my reloads. So for this reloading video, we're going to be using this bench source annealer that I have down here, and I'll show a picture of it in a second. But it uses two propane torches. You can use map gas if you want. That reduces the annealing time just a little bit, but I like to use the propane because I feel like it gives me a little bit more even heat and a little bit more control over the heat, and I can dial that in with the duration that the brass is exposed to the heat. So let's talk about annealing for a little bit. So annealing is correcting what happens to the brass when it goes through the reloading cycle and the firing cycle. So when we fire the brass, the brass expands to fit our chamber. When we reload the brass, we size the brass back down. So we're working at two different times there, just in one firing and one reloading. So what happens to the brass is it gets work hardened. So imagine a piece of, or a paper clip or something like that. A paper clip is generally nice and soft and you keep bending it back and forth in the same place and it's going to become hard and brittle and eventually you're going to break it. So that's the same process that's happening with our brass when we shoot it. There is some brass you can get away with maybe annealing it every three or four firings or so or maybe even more. It just depends on your sizing process in your chamber and a couple of other variables. But if you want to maintain consistent neck tension across the board, then annealing your brass every time is truly the only way to go. That's the only way you can control it. So as far as the process goes, what we're doing is we're bringing the neck and only the neck of the brass up to a specific temperature where the brass, the metallurgy in the brass actually changes the grain structure changes to where the brass is in a soft annealed state. And that lets us size the brass easier. It lets the brass uh, maintain the diameter and the, the dimensions of the sizing die a lot better. There's less spring back. A lot of people are confused about that, but annealed brass has less spring back than unannealed brass. That's how you maintain even neck tension and even dimensions in your, your sizing. So the process is very simple. All we have to do is heat the brass up and there's a couple key things to remember here when we're going through the process. You want to only heat the neck and kind of the shoulder junction of the brass up when you're annealing it. You don't want the heat to travel down to the case head and the bottom of the brass because you have a case head rupture and it will soften the brass to a point where it's actually dangerous for you to use. So if you have any brass that ends up getting uh, too hot down there at the bottom, toss it out, it's not worth it. It's just trash at that point. So what we're doing is we're exposing the brass to heat for a, a set duration and on the bench source annealer, as you'll see here in a second, it's got a really nice little rotary dial where you can dial in seconds that it's exposed to the two torches and you can get a pretty accurate uh, annealing process going with it. So. There's some people who take this a couple step further, a couple steps further, and they'll use one of the, the larger propane tanks and they'll attach a regulator to it and they feel that that gives them a uh, more consistent and a repeatable process as far as the output of the propane torches. I just use two little commonly available handheld uh, propane bottles. These are just 14 ounce bottles and they screw on there and they work really well. So. In, in my method, what I do to maintain a consistent uh, heat output from lot to lot of annealing as I go through the process with different cartridges, different reloading uh, periods and stuff, I turn the torches on full blast all the way. So the as long as the temperature is relatively stable in the room, 
the pressure of the liquid gas that's inside of the propane is gonna come out relatively the same. If you increase the temperature in your room, then you're gonna have an increase in pressure and probably an increase in heat. Likewise, if you decrease the temperature in your reloading room, then you're gonna have lower pressure with your propane and you're gonna have a little less heat or a little less flame. So my reloading room stays pretty stable at about 65 to 70 degrees pretty much the whole entire year, even through winter. I have the heater on and it maintains a really stable temperature. So I've never had an issue. And I've done this enough to where I can look at the flame on the propane torches and I can judge it based on that and see exactly where I need to be. So I run the two torches wide open and I start out with very, very little time on the brass. And I do that just to make sure that the torches are aligned and they're pointed and applying the heat to the brass in the place that I want them to. So a lot of people make a big fuss about annealing and it is a very important process and there's some very fancy, fancy annealers out there like the amp annealer. Um, but I try to keep the process simple and I've had really good luck so far. I have really low extreme spread with my brass. I have very good accuracy and I've never had an issue that I could relate to poor annealing practices. So this is what I do, you guys. There's a lot of different methods out there. This one works for me. It's fast, it's reliable, it's simple, and it's effective. So let's take a look at how I do it. All right, guys, so first thing we need to do is light up our torches. So they're roughly pointed in the direction I want them to go. So we'll turn them on both full blast. We'll light them up. All right, so as you can see, the flames kind of come out different lengths and I know, they're actually pretty darn close. So we can adjust them by moving the torch fore and aft and try to get a little bit more even placement with the torches. So they're at roughly a, eh, it's a little bit less than a 90 degree angle, maybe a 65, 70 degree angle to each other. And that gives us a nice application of heat on our brass. So from here, let's we'll start up our machine and Right down here is the little rotary dial that controls the time that the brass is exposed to the heat. So all we do to set it up is, first off, I'm gonna turn it on, and it's set to the very minimal time right there. So this heat, this exposure to heat just for setting up doesn't really do anything to the metallurgy of the brass. It's exposed to it to a very short time, the brass isn't getting that hot, and I can still pick it up after it goes through the flames but we're just trying to align our brass to the torches and it's actually pretty darn good. I'm not even gonna touch it. So pick this up, it gets a little warm, but no problem, no problem touching it. So we can get started. And so the way that I determine how much time to expose my brass to the flame is based on the color of the brass. So. I used to use Tempelac and some of the temperature indicating fluids, but I've discovered that the Tempelac inside the case mouth, first of all, it's a pain to use. And, and what that is, is it's a, it's a uh, liquid that's applied to the inside of the case neck right there. And it changes color when it reaches a certain temperature. So after you anneal your brass, if you wanna use that piece or those pieces that you apply the liquid to, you gotta clean it out, it's kind of a pain, and I found it's super unreliable. There are Tempelac pencils that you can use that you can touch to the outside of the brass as it's being heated, but once again, I found it to be unreliable on this particular machine because the flames, actually, there's nowhere that you can put the pencil on the neck of the brass where it's not gonna be in contact with the flame, and it gives you a false reading. You can touch it right after it comes off the flame and that kind of works, but you lose a little bit of heat, believe it or not, from the point it comes off the flame until it rotates one position. So I just do it based on the color of the brass. So what you wanna look for, or how I do this, is I'm gonna dim the lights here in a second. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna run the brass through the annealer and we're gonna watch it till it changes colors. So we wanna see a very, very slight red glow in the brass. And that indicates it's somewhere north of the 600 degree mark, which is where we wanna be. So ideally brass is annealed between about 650 and 750. And the way it works is it's kind of a, 
a very gradual slope and then all of a sudden when you hit a certain temperature the brass anneals rather quickly and once you exceed that temperature the brass annealing process kind of slows down so the majority of the annealing process is done usually between 650 and 750 degrees anywhere below that in it starts to anneal and it can anneal a little bit slower but it takes more time under lower heat and we don't want the heat to sink down towards the case head and give us a problem so that's why we use the torches and we apply the most heat that we can in the quickest manner so it keeps the heat up here in the case neck and shoulder junction so let's dim the lights and we will get this set up and run some brass through it all right guys so i have the reloading room dimmed down pretty good and i think you guys are zoomed in enough to actually see the color change in the brass that we're looking for so we'll start out at one second that's usually my starting place for this machine and we'll put one piece of brass on there and once again we're just looking for the brass to just change colors and start to turn red it turns too red and that's a little too much so we're looking for it there and obviously there's that was one second in the flame and it didn't change much there so the brass is still not too hot we could pick it up and set it down so we'll bump it up to one and a half seconds and we'll see how that goes and i have a general idea of where we need to be because i've done this so much and this machine is so repeatable but watch the brass and it just turned orange there so we're right about where we need to be it was at the very end i like it to be a little bit hotter than that so we'll bump it up maybe another tenth of a second we'll see how that looks so you'll see the inside of the case neck there and just starts to turn cherry maybe go up just a little bit more and that's maybe a little too much so we'll back it down and we'll run a couple more through it this pinch torsen annealer is absolutely awesome it runs through brass really quickly and like i mentioned it's just easy to set up it's consistent and this gives you a good angle so you can see where my flames are kind of aiming at the next shoulder junction so that's right about where you want it and that keeps the heat in the upper part of the brass and that's being annealed really really nicely so forgot to mention i have some hornady cases mixed in with this lot right here that we just dialed the machine in with so the differences in the brass thickness is going to change how the brass anneals i don't particularly care about the hornady brass i use it for fowlers and stuff like that the lapua brass is what we set the machine up to so if you saw some of the brass get a little bit too hot that was the hornady brass that was going through the annealer so we run all 35 cases through this it goes real quick and we end up with really nice annealed brass the process is that simple it goes rather quickly and it's a very minor operation in the grand scheme of things and it offers us really good repeatable neck tension which gives us good extreme velocity spread and really low sds all right guys so here we have the first six out of the annealer so on the left here is the lapua brass and like i said this is what i set the machine up for and as you can see we have that really nice color change right up there just south of the neck shoulder junction or the the shoulder actually and that's exactly where we wanted if you ever look at a piece of factory lapua brass which i'll throw up on the screen here in a second that's just about where the heat sink from the annealing process that Lapu uses at the factory goes. On the right here, we have three Hornady cases just to show you the difference that neck thickness and material thickness makes in this process. So you can see, it's pretty clear as day, that the Hornady brass on the right there got quite a bit hotter than the Lapua brass. This is still okay, you're not gonna hurt it as long as the heat stays up here in the top side of the case. But this is truly what I'm looking for right here and that's how I dial in the annealer. So that's a really good example of kind of what I like to do and what I try to avoid. So we saw both sides of that and now we can take these cases and we can go through our sizing process and we have nice soft annealed brass that's going to maintain the dimensions of the sizing die and maintain a nice consistent inside neck diameter so our bullet seating is really consistent across the board. 
All right, so on to the next step, which is sizing. I have gone through several different iterations of sizing dies through the last 20 years, and what I've landed on as of late is just using a simple Redding or RCBS bushing full length die. So that accomplishes two different things in one stroke of the press. So you're full length sizing your brass and you're also controlling your neck tension with a unique bushing. So you can buy these bushings in 1,000th increments and control the neck tension in relation to the neck thickness of your brass. So if you have a thicker neck uh, brass, then you can buy a larger bushing. If you have thinner necked brass, then you can buy a smaller bushing. So you maintain that neck tension that you want. I typically run two, two thousandths of neck tension straight across the board unless I find a reason to run otherwise. But two thousandths gives me consistent neck tension. It gives me good neck tension. It's a safe neck tension. I don't get bullets set back in the magazines from any of my rifles, even the Magnums. And I find that it also is pretty good for accuracy. So the way we set the die up is pretty simple. I start with these dies just barely touching the shell holder. So I have a Redding or RCBS shell holder down here, which fits the six Creedmoor case. And then we have our die screwed in. So it just barely touches the shell holder. I'll size a piece of brass with this setup right here, and then we'll measure from the neck down to the case head, and what we want to achieve is at least one and a half to two thousandths of setback of the neck in relation to the case head, and that gives us the ability to chamber the case easily, we won't get hung up on anything, and it has zero effect on accuracy, believe it or not. So we'll go ahead and do that. And the brass is, or the, the die is already preset right where it needs to be. It's set to give me two thousandths of uh, shoulder setback. And the way we measure that is pretty simple. Have a pair of calipers with a little uh, comparator on the end of them. And the comparator has an insert that fits the angle of the neck of the six Creedmoor case. And we simply take a measurement from our non-sized brass and we zero the calipers out on that and then I'll size it until and screw the I'm sorry screw the die down until we achieve two thousandths of setback in our neck so let's take a look at what the comparator looks like just so you guys can get a good idea of what kind of equipment we're using in this game all right guys so here are my Mitotoya calipers with the comparator and the comparator insert so here's the comparator body and here's the insert, and it's just held in with a set screw. So as you can see, what we do is we zero out the calipers as they rest against the comparator insert. Then we take our brass, and the neck of the brass lines up with the angle in the comparator insert there. And then we just insert the brass, and light pressure on it. You don't want to ram it in there. So we get one inch, 528. So what I'll do to maintain simplicity is I'll just zero the calipers out right there and that's basically my starting dimension so we want this ultimately when we put a piece of brass in there to read two thousandths or minus two thousandths under that so there's our zero there's one thousandth under there's one and a half and there's two so that's what we want to see when we're done and we have our sizing die all set up All right, so we talked about the bushing setup in our sizing die. The way we determine the proper bushing uh, dimension or diameter is we measure, we take a case and we undersize it. So the neck is gonna be tighter than it needs to be. So just pick a bushing that gives you pretty decent uh, neck constriction. And then what we wanna do is seat a bullet, the bullet that you're gonna use, and then measure the outside diameter I'm going to make sure the calipers are zeroed out first because we have the comparator on there, so they're zeroed. Now we measure the outside diameter of the neck and try to be as accurate as you can. So this is measuring 270, so 0.270, and we got a half in there too, so we'll call it 0 0.270. So that's the outside dimension of our neck, and if we're using quality brass like we're using Lapua, the neck thicknesses should be very, very close or close enough for what we're doing here. The bench rest guys like to get their necks even cl 
closer and more consistent, so they'll turn the outside of the necks to a known dimension once the inside is expanded to a known dimension. So they have perfectly consistent neck thicknesses across all the brass that they're gonna load. So we measured 270, and what we wanna do from there is we wanna subtract 2,000. So that gives us 0.268, that's the bushing that we want to use to achieve, to achieve two thousandths of neck tension. It's that simple. So you size one, make sure you have good neck tension, seat a bullet where it needs to go, measure the OD of the neck, the outside diameter of the neck, subtract two thousandths or however much neck tension you want, and that's the size of the bushing that you're typically going to go with. So one caveat to that is how I have changed up my reloading process here in the last year or so. So what I do is I'll undersize my neck so that they're tighter than they need to be. And then I take them and I run them through a expanding mandrel that achieves the two thousandths or one and a half thousandths of neck tension that I want. So what we're doing is we're expanding the neck from the inside, which is the critical surface of the neck. That's where our bullet's gonna see and that's what determines our neck tension. So by using an expanding mandrel, we get accurate and consistent inside diameters of all of our necks. So I size them under a little bit with my first operation. So the expanding mandrel has a little bit more uh, contact with the case neck and it expands it out perfectly, just very, very slightly, one thousandth of an inch to right where I want it to be. So let's get to sizing these pieces of brass. All right, before we run the brass through our die, there's one important process that we need to do. So we have a case lube pad here. We just take a little bit of this Imperial sizing die wax, a little can of this lasts a long time, and then we kind of spread it out over the case lube pad. And that gives us the lube so the, die, the brass doesn't stick inside your die. If you run dry brass inside of a sizing die, then you're going to stick it and you'll have a really bad day and it's a pain in the butt to get your brass out of there. I've done it several times. So this is a quick process. All we do is set half a dozen cases on there, even pressures, roll them back and forth and our cases are lubed. They're ready to go. So now we can put them through our sizing die and not worry about sticking a piece of brass in the die. All right, so we have our six millimeter sizing die all set up from before. And all we're gonna do is take our piece of brass, put it in the shell holder, run it up until it stops, and bring it out. And it's as simple as that. So that gives us our neck sizing, it bumps the shoulder down two thousandths of an inch, and it sizes all the way down to just north of the case head. So right about the web area of the case. So we'll size all of our brass here. And on to the next step after this. All right, here we are at our next step, which is cutting our brass to length, chamfering the inside, and deburring the outside of the case necks. So every time we fire our brass, the forces that expand the brass to the chamber also push material forward. So we get a little bit of brass growth every time that we shoot our brass. Some cases, it's worse than others. Cases with a steeper neck, like the Six Creedmoor, tend to stay a very, very consistent length, so you might just have to shave just a little bit off of the necks, but cases with a lazier uh, neck angle tend to, to flow out a little bit more towards the neck and you have a little bit more to trim. So for the trimming process, we're gonna use this Giro trimmer. This thing is an absolute lifesaver. It works for every single caliber you can imagine. So it uses these uh, case adapters here that thread into the top of the machine and you buy these, they're caliber specific, and your brass fits in there, and it protrudes through, and you can adjust it with this die lock ring to the exact length that you want. Very simple to set up. And then you even have different cutters for the different calibers. So I have one of these for six mil, one for six five, one for seven, and one for 30 cal. And you just switch these out, and they're preset for that caliber and the process is very simple. So we'll get this thing set up and we'll get to trimming our brass.
All right, so this machine works very simple. It's just like using one of the old pencil sharpeners, the electric ones that you have in school. So all you do is put it in the case holder, push down, and you'll hear the cutter uh, start to bite on the edge of the case, and then it will kind of free up, and you'll hear the difference in, in the cutter when it's contacting the brass. And once it's done with that, your brass is done. So this does all three operations at once. It trims to length, chamfers the inside, and deburs the outside all in one. So here we go. It's a little loud, so I'll just run a couple through it. <laughs> All right, it's as simple as that and it goes that fast. It's really a cool way to trim your brass. And what's nice about it is it references the case neck right there, which is a great place to, to reference your, your length from. Since that, if you size your brass and you do everything correctly, the case neck dimension from here to the head should be really consistent. So therefore your dimension from the case neck to the head or the case mouth should be really consistent as well. If you have uh, messed up sizing practices or you're not getting consistent shoulder bump, then this dimension will not be the same. But I'll get you guys a close up right here so you can see exactly how our brass comes out of this machine. It's absolutely perfect and ready to go. All right, guys, just a little review of where we're at right now. So. Real quick, we started out with our one fire brass. We decapped it in a universal decapping die. We threw it in our rotary tumbler down there with some stainless steel pins, some water, and a little bit of detergent. Came out nice and sparkly clean. We separated the stainless steel media out of the brass, cleaned it with some fresh water, and then we set it outside for a couple hours and let it dry off. So from there, our brass was ready to size. We lubed our brass up on a case lube pad with some imperial sizing die wax. And then we got our sizing die set up. So it gave us our two thousandths of neck setback. And then it also gave us the proper outside diameter for two thousandths of neck tension, two separate dimensions we're looking for there. So we ran all of our brass through our sizing die. Now, after that, it was ready to trim. So we ran our brass through the Giro trimmer and we achieved three different things with that. We cut to length, we chamfered the inside neck of the brass and we deburred the outside. So at this point, here's a little discussion point. We have a mix of some Hornady brass here and some Lapua brass. And I can tell you guys from experience and anyone who's shot Lapua brass knows that it's basically the best there is. There's some really good stuff out there, but as far as consistency goes, I haven't found anything better than the Lapua brass. So I don't do anything at all with Lapua brass after this point. From here, I will prime these and I'll powder them and then we'll see the bullet with the Lapua brass. However, with other commercially available brass, like the Winchester stuff, the Federal stuff, the Hornady stuff, stuff that comes out of a box from a shelf and it's mass produced, I will do a little bit more to prep the brass. And this is a one-time prep for the life of the brass. I only do this once. So what I do is I square up the primer pocket. So there's a little tool that I'll throw up on the screen here in a second. And I chuck it up in a drill motor, like a little Makita a cordless drill. And it just takes a couple seconds and you run it in the primer pocket. And what it does is it cuts nice, even, uh, a nice even surface on the inside of your primer pocket. So when you seat your primers, they seat nice and evenly and get a good seal inside the pocket. After that, I'll take a flash hole reamer and I'll run that in the flash hole just by hand. It just takes a couple of rotations. Sometimes there's some big burrs on this commercially available brass and that will affect your combustion or your ignition from the primer. So I'll true the flash holes, I'll true the primer pockets and from there, the brass is ready. And I never do that again, unless there's a problem and that lasts the lifetime of the brass once that's done. From there, I just go about the same process that we went through and end up with sized and trimmed brass. We primer it and we powder it and we go to town. So that's just a, a slight difference that, that I go about with the 
the high quality brass versus the commercially available brass. And not to say that the commercially available stuff isn't high quality, it's good quality, but it just doesn't have the consistency in that perfection that the Lapua brass does to where the, you, you don't have to do anything to Lapua brass. You spend a lot more for it, but it lasts a little bit longer in my opinion, and it has better properties that give you better consistency and accuracy. So the case walls are consistent from case to case and uh, primer pockets are nice and uniform. Flash holes are really nice and uniform. And you sometimes find little abnormalities in the commercially available stuff that are easily corrected to give you brass that's probably darn near as close to Lapua. It just takes a little bit more work and a little bit more time, but you get the same product when you're done. So hopefully that clears that up and we're not gonna run through the process of prepping the Hornady brass because it's very simple. I'm just gonna show the tools, but suffice to say, all you do is run each of these tools in the primer pocket and the flash hole and you're done. It takes literally a couple of seconds. So I'll get the tools up there so you guys can see what they look like in case you are gonna run commercially available brass and you wanna do that. I think it's a good practice to do. It's just another one of those things that we can control and we can fix in our brass and make consistent across the board that's gonna give us better consistency. And that's, that is the name of the game here is consistency. So whatever you do, do it to every case and make sure that every case is as similar as you can possibly make it. So let's take a look at those tools. All right, so you're looking at our two different tools here. There's two sizes of our primer pocket uniformer here, but essentially two different tools for two different operations that we just discussed. But first off over here, this is the first thing I'll do. These are primer, primer pocket uniforming tools. These are carbide tools. So they're very sharp, long lasting. They hold their edge very well. You can buy them from Brownells, from Sinclair, any of the big reloading places, even Midway carries stuff like this to uniform your primer pockets. So I'll just chuck this little piece into my cordless drill and it fits. So this is a large primer pocket uniformer and this is a small primer pocket uniformer. So our Lapua brass that we're using here, those are two Hornady pieces, another Hornady piece. All right, there's a piece of Lapua. So the Lapua is small primer pocket brass. So we would take this and we'd run it in there just like that. And I can tell you right now, it's not taking anything off the inside of the primer pocket. So if we try that on a piece of Hornady brass, however, yeah, so it's taken a, taken a good bite. You can probably see the shavings and maybe some of the shininess where the cutter is contacting the bottom of the primer pocket. So chuck that in a drill and it only takes a couple seconds, maybe two or three seconds on the tool to uniform your primer pocket and you're done for the life of the brass. All right, the next process is uniforming our flash holes. So for this, we use this little reamer here and this is a very simple tool. It's just set to the correct diameter of the inside of your flash hole. And this thing reverses right here for small rifle primer and large rifle primer. So we're gonna use this on the Hornady brass, which is large rifle primer. And very simple, I use it by hand. All you do is stick it in there, give it a couple turns, and you can feel it taking a very light cut on the inside of your flash hole. So we'll run it through one more. And that one's taking a little bit heavier cut some of them take a few turns, but you end up with perfectly uniform reamed flash holes, which is what we want. Once again, one of those things we can control and our search for consistency and accuracy. So just ran four Hornady cases through this thing and each one of them felt different, which just proves the point that there's inconsistencies in this commercially available brass. But once you do these two processes, you can run, you can have brass that's pretty darn good. There's a couple of other things that we could do to this brass that might bring it up to a little bit higher level. But for what we're trying to achieve here, which is good accuracy, it's acceptable accuracy for what we're shooting, which is the PRS type stuff. I'm not shooting off of a bench, trying to achieve little tiny, tiny one hole groups. We're just trying to get something that holds half a minute to a little bit less of that in accuracy. So this achieves that very easily and it's very minimal brass prep. 
and once again, it's repeatable, it's consistent, and it gives us the results that we want for what we're trying to do with our rifle. All right, now we come to our very last process here. And I mentioned this before, but what we do is we're going to expand the inside diameter of the necks to a known dimension so we can achieve a consistent two thousandths of neck tension for all the brass we're reloading. So when we ran our brass through the sizing die, I measured it, we had our, our two thousandths goal. I subtracted another one thousandth of an inch off of that for the bushing. So now our brass is undersized or smaller in diameter, our case neck is smaller in diameter than what we want. So technically right now, it should give us three thousandths of neck tension. I want to make that two thousandths of neck tension. So we're going to run an expanding mandrel made by K&M, and that's going to open up the neck that extra thousandth of an inch. So we will have an even and consistent inside diameter of our necks to give us that two thousandths of neck tension and we're going to have very very consistent bullet seating and good accuracy and good velocity with this process so here we go all right guys so here are the tools we use for this process so here we have a km or km expanding mandrel and they sell these in half thousand increments so you can achieve exactly the neck tension that you want and all it does is it threads into this little press adapter and you have a window there at the front. So I usually thread the expanding mandrel down to where you can see the whole entire thing. And then you want to adjust this in your press and you'll see here in a second, but you want the case neck to almost come to the very top of the expander. So it's definitely not on the taper writing up to the correct diameter. And it's pretty simple to use. So we'll get that set up in a second. And one other thing to mention is this thing works best if the brass is lubed. So I don't like to use uh, wax on this. You can, but you have to get it out of there before you reload your brass. So I use this Imperial dry lube and all this is is Molly, looks like Molly dust or something like that. But you put the Molly dust or the dry lube in these little ceramic beads that they also sell as application media. So. You shake it all up and it coats the ceramic beads and it gives a nice even coating on the inside and outside of your case neck. One thing to note is after we sized these, they still had a lot of residual wax on them. So one thing I did off camera was I wiped all of the wax off of them. If you're doing a ton of brass, then like I said before, you can throw it in a vibratory tumbler and that takes it off pretty easily as well. But I just take a rag, a shop rag, and I can wipe them off with a little alcohol and it only takes a few seconds. So our brass is nice and clean on the outside. If you, if you leave wax on there, then you're gonna get a lot of the dry lube sticking on the outside and it just makes a horrible mess. So the process for this is simple. I just stick it in there, give it a couple turns, and there we go. We have a nice coating of the dry lube on the inside and the outside of our brass. So then it's ready to run through the expander. All right, so here we have our expanding mandrel all set up to the right length, and now we're gonna run our brass. And I have all the brass pre-prepped. It's all lubed with our dry neck media, our dry neck lube. And all we do is run it up, and you can feel very slight tension, and that's all that it takes. So you can see I have it almost to the top of the mandrel right before it contacts the body of it, and that's what we want. So you can feel the neck material being expanded. And once again, what that does is it allows us to have consistent seating pressure and neck tension. So we're sizing from the inside of the neck as opposed to the outside. Any variances in the case neck thickness will change the inside dimension if you only size from the outside, right? Because we're not controlling at that point what happens on the inside. This way we're actually controlling the inside neck diameter of our brass. So there we go, that's all we do. And that's what achieves really consistent velocity and really good accuracy with our reloads. Now, one thing to note is after you run it through the expanding mandrel, you have obviously a little bit of dry neck lube on the outside. 
I'll just take a rag once again and wipe these off real quick and that's it. The stuff isn't sticky, it comes off really easily and I'll leave the neck lube on the inside of the neck. So if you remember correctly, I mentioned this when we were talking about the, the wet media tumbling that we did previously, but that stainless steel stuff gets all the carbon out. So this is essentially just raw brass on the inside of the neck. If you seat a bullet with uh, the copper jacket against the, the uncoated brass, if you will, the, just the raw brass on the inside of the neck, you can have some fluctuations in neck tension. And that's just because you almost get a sort of galling effect when the brass contacts the copper jacket. And it just doesn't feel good when you're seating a bullet and it shows up over the chronograph in some pretty significant velocity swings. And that's one of the reasons why bench rest shooters don't touch their necks. So a bench rest shooter will typically not even tumble their, bra their brass. They might wipe off the outside to get some of the grit and grime off, but they leave all the carbon on the inside because that allows them to do the same thing. It essentially lubes the bullet as it's going into the neck and as it's being fired. So we're achieving that with this dry media and what I found is it actually gets applied pretty darn evenly to the inside of the neck, especially after you run three or four of the cases through there and the media starts to, or the the dry lube starts to actually coat the expanding mandrel and then you get a nice even coat on all the brass from there on. And we'll see the benefits of that when we start seating our bullets. You get really smooth, really smooth bullet seating. And once again, that leads to the primarily really good velocity spread. So something typically you'll have velocity spread that's under 20 feet per second for, you know, a, a test of 10 rounds or something like that. But that's it. As far as this process goes, very simple. It only takes a couple seconds, but it has huge benefits as far as your accuracy goes. So I would highly recommend it. These tools aren't overly expensive. If I remember correctly, this little setup right here is right around 50 bucks. And you essentially only need one of these little uh, expanding mandrel bodies right here for each caliber. You could run a 2000s neck tension for each of your calibers and end up with a couple of them. So I have these for six, six, five, and 30. Those are the, the primary calibers that I load precision ammo for. And they work out real well. They should last forever if you take care of them. And it's just a good way to go. So highly recommend it. At the very beginning of this video, I mentioned we were gonna talk a little bit about new brass prep, and I'm sure that that had some people scratching their heads and asking, why would you ever prep new brass? And the answer is pretty simple, because it isn't perfect. So if you want to spend the time and reload ammo, I want it to be worthwhile. So I want my ammo, even with fresh new brass, to go out there and shoot lights out every single time. With the high-end brass, like I've been preaching throughout this whole entire video, like Lapua, you have very little brass prep to do. With Lapua brass, about the only thing that I will do is I will expand the necks. Usually they come sized far too small, small for what I like, and I'll expand them so I have my two thousandths of neck tension. And after that, that brass shoots. There's no issues with it at all, and you just reload as normal. However, with some of the commercially available brass, like the Winchester stuff, the Hornady stuff, Federal, you name it, some of it gets beat up and has different dimensions from packaging, shipping, whatever it may be, but some of it comes to you and it's almost so bad that you can throw it out. In fact, I got some Winchester brass. I've thrown out a lot of Winchester brass straight out of the bag just because it was so dented and beat up, but you can save some of it. So what I will do is I'll first start out with uniforming the primer pockets. Very first thing I'll do on commercially available brass before I fire it. I'll uniform the primer pockets, uniform the flash holes, and then from there, I'll lube the brass up and I'll run it through my full length sizing die just to make sure that it's at least somewhat round. So if it's smashed at all, something that's barely perceivable, then I'll run it through the sizing die and that should iron it out enough to shoot and give you reasonable accuracy on the first firing. After that, it's fire form to your chamber and you're pretty much good to go. 
Aside from that, there's nothing else that I do. If the brass doesn't have a good chamfer in the front and it's gonna cause issues with bullet seating, then I'll throw a slight chamfer on the case mouth. But that's about it, you guys. There's not a whole lot that goes into uh, new brass prep. I typically will shoot Lapua for about everything that I can these days. I still use some of the Winchester brass for stuff like my 300 Win Mag. I found it's a really good uh, brass choice for that caliber. It lasts a long time. And I'll still go through that whole process like I just mentioned with you guys. And I can make that stuff absolutely hammer and have no issues with it whatsoever. So that wraps that part of it up. And I think that that about does it for today. So that wraps up our brass processing video. Pretty simple stuff, you guys. There's just a few little uh, tips and tricks in there that I hope that you guys found beneficial and maybe you can modify or try these things out and see if it makes a difference for you. It may or may not, but these things that I've done are the result of doing this for 20 years and this is kind of what I've landed on and what works best for me and possibly or almost definitely I would say that it will change because I'm constantly looking for things to improve my consistency and accuracy that are simple, that don't take a lot of time, that I can do very easily and incorporate into my routine that show good results. So stuff like different tools, different dies. I have a uh, new sizing die from Area 419 over there that I'm just now starting to experiment with. I didn't break it out for this video even though it is set up for six Creedmoor, but I haven't messed with it yet so I'm not real familiar with how to use it or what it's gonna do to the brass. So we'll save that for a different day, but this is the basic process that I use and I, I reiterate myself and I, I feel like I repeat myself a lot on these videos, but I'm trying to emphasize a couple really important points. And what we're looking for is consistency in our brass. So that means having a consistent process day in and day out as we do this, and that's gonna lend itself very well to giving us that good accuracy and good uh, small velocity spread that we're looking for so we can achieve good long range accuracy. So, hopefully you guys enjoyed that. This was the first video that we did that kind of got into some technical stuff. We talked about some temperatures with annealing and a little bit of stuff like that. That's a whole rabbit hole that you could spend a whole entire episode on. And I'm not a metallurgist, so I understand the very basic principles of it, but there's some people out there, and hopefully if you do have a real strong knowledge of metallurgy and the annealing process, chime in in the comment section and let me know if there's something else that we should be looking for or something that I should change. Once again, I, I have an open mind to this stuff and I'm constantly looking at other people's processes and seeing what works and what doesn't and adapting mine to suit those so I can get the best, best product that I can. That's it for today, guys. I appreciate you all watching. If you like what you see, hit the like and subscribe button so you see these videos pop up right when they're released. And next week, we're gonna get into a little bit more with the reloading process, and we're going to figure out a starting powder charge, we're gonna prime our brass, and we're gonna get it all the way up to the point where we seat our bullets. If we have time, we may actually incorporate bullet seating into that video, but these videos are getting pretty long, and I'm trying to keep them not so long, but uh, right around the 30 minute mark is where I want it to be, and so far, we've been over that time on every one, which is fine because there's a lot of information to cover. But that being said, you guys have a good rest of your weekend and have a good next week. And we'll see you next weekend with our fourth episode of the Precision Rifle Reloading Series. Guys, take it easy.